Hi, everyone. I am Brian Sweeney, and I'm one of the consultants at the Educator Collaborative. And it is my pleasure right now to introduce Sara Ahmed and to let you know a little bit about her impressive career. So Sara has taught at about as many different schools as there can be, uh, independent schools, public schools, everything, uh, international schools too. Uh, currently, she's still teaching. She's teaching literacy and social studies at the Bishop School in San Diego, California. And her writing and her teaching are both built around the importance of identity inquiry and social responsibility. Now, I used to teach middle school. I teach high school right now, but I remember middle school very well. And to me, I always thought it was impossible to get students to both realize important things about themselves and at the same time compare about, uh, to care about the world around them. Teaching people to look inward and outward at the same time was and is really hard work. But Sarah's impressive work and her teachings show that that work is not just possible, but absolutely necessary. She has a new book out in November, which she's co-written with Harvey Smokey Daniels, and it's titled How to Engage Middle School Hearts and Minds with Inquiry. Her focus today is on similarly themed, reaching middle school hearts to teach middle school minds. And I'm going to pass it over to her. Uh, before I do, though, I just want to reiterate how the, the tweeting works with this whole day. Her hashtag, Sarah's hashtag, is hashtag the Ed Collab Gathering hashtag seven. And I'm going to kind of shut up in a second and spend the time monitoring these tweets. So we really want to emphasize that if you have questions, ask your questions and I'll cut in and, and ask them to Sara. Um, so it's great if you're really enthusiastic about things and want to share what you like. That's wonderful too. But please, you know, take the opportunity to ask questions and she's here to answer them. So here's Sara. And I'm going to stop talking now. Here you are, Sarah. Thanks, Brian. Good morning, everybody from San Diego. Um, we are in the middle of a extreme heat wave and a drought. But we are um, broadcasting live this morning for you. going to share a little bit about um, my upcoming book and also some of the work that we're doing with middle schoolers today. Thanks, Brian, for that great intro. Um, hopefully you guys can all see my screen. Here we go. Um, like Brian introduced me earlier, I, I've been teaching um, for about 12 years now. I went through the University of Iowa for the School of Ed, and then I um, did some work in some international schools in Dublin, Ireland. After that, I moved to um, Chicago, where I worked in Chicago Public Schools for about nine years. I'm in I got sick of the winters in Chicago, and now I am here in San Diego, where it's far more pleasant from November through April. Um, so go ahead and um, follow us along on Twitter if you guys have any questions. Brian is there to field everything. Um, we'd love to hear from you and do the best we can at answering some of your questions. Um, like Brian shared, I have a book coming out in November with my good buddy and mentor, Smokey Daniels. Um, the book is really about growing a caring classroom community. Um, you know a community that supports its members, monitors, investigates, cares for the world beyond just the walls of the classroom. It means that helping young people, you know, to learn, to think hard, to be critical thinkers, build knowledge, become skilled researchers, and communicate carefully with the world. Um, we hope that they do it, you know, in the service of humanity and not just themselves. But it's really about getting them to ask the questions and wonder. And from those questions, hopefully, they become um, compassionate citizens of our world. Here's a little bit of a window into our book. If you can start to see the emphasis, we do really focus on the kids and the classroom and our love for middle schoolers that so many of us share. Just a sneak peek of some word clouds from some of the chapters. And here they are, the stars of my classroom today. Um, I want you to start thinking, get in that middle school mindset, if that means coming up in, in your mind, thinking about your years in middle school, however that um, feels for you right now. Um, this is sort of what it looks like, not every day, but on Halloween. Um, and middle schoolers, you know, automatically, hopefully some of you are laughing because you're either thinking of your own memories and you're feeling empathetic towards these guys.
One of my favorite reads um, that was given to me by a mentor at Burley School of mine, Michelle Timble, is um, Yardsticks by Chip Wood. And in that book, there's a great piece from ages 4 through 14, pieces on social and academic development, um, how kids grow, how they respond to you, what's going on in their physical development, their academic development. Um, how funny they are, how inquisitive they are, um, how they act for their parents versus you, which I often hear from parents. And it's something that I give out um, on parent night, open, open house night that we have. I share pieces of a read aloud of this book with uh, parents. And often when I have middle school parents coming to me, talking to me about their kids, you know, I can't get them to talk about school. I can't get them to really open up to me. I'm trying to communicate with them. They seem a little more closed off. I usually give them this book as a recommendation um, and I share this often with parents and I, it's great because they come back to me and they say, oh no, he's totally normal. You're right. It's fine. I'll be fine. And you know, we kind of weather, weather the adolescent storm together. But one of my other um, you know, life's mentors that I've been reading since I started in the School of Education is Don Graves. And you know, Don Graves made it his life work to really get to know kids before they can begin to teach, and I've adopted that philosophy from him um, and so many of my other mentors, Smokey included. Um, and there really is a, in, a strong importance in knowing your students. You know, I say to teachers often that the students are my curriculum, you know, and the rest can be scaffolded. The kids are my, my number one, you know, my page one, my number one unit, whatever that is. We start the day we start the year with, with the kids first, and that's really getting to know them. So I just have a small read aloud from Don Graves, A Sea of Faces. September 2006 marks my 50th anniversary teaching school. I began teaching seventh grade reading and science. I taught with only eight weeks of teacher preparation from an intensive summer program. The shortage of teachers was so great. The shortage of teachers was so great that the state of Massachusetts offered courses to assist the public schools. Helen Porter, the principal of East Fairhaven School, who observed me teaching in the summer, said, this will be the last time you'll ever see 12 children in your class. I was oblivious to her meaning. In fact, she said, you'll be teaching 39 seventh graders. If she thought I could handle the situation, I would. No big deal. On that first day, the children kept filing in while casting furtive glances at me, studying me, wondering who I was, and pondering their next moves. I wasn't used to having so much scrutiny. One boy, David Brown, stared at me with large brown eyes. I stared back. What does your staring mean, I challenged. He challenged back. I lost my plan at about 10 that morning and had to teach the rest of the day by telling stories and reading aloud. A sea of faces tilted upward. They paid attention for a while but soon grew restless. The students began to talk, nudge, and poke at each other. I was teaching on the fly. They knew it, and I knew it. I was totally exhausted at the end of the day and sat in a stupor, wondering what I'd ever do the next day. I wanted the class to like me, but what I didn't realize is that students don't like you unless you know the details that allow you to like them. Further, I needed to know the details of how I learned, what they wanted, and what interested them. Such detail was beyond me, so I taught them as a whole group. Tone is important. So Don Graves, um, you know, had a day like I think some of us have had before, and you're just feeling like, yep, you're in there, you know the kids, um, you know what you're doing, and you start to sort of almost feel like you're going to wing it because you're trying trying to respond to them, but you're, you're not really, you're not engaged with them fully. Um, you know, this is the early years of teaching, um, not a mistake, but an experience that we all have. So what he did is he moved um, to a, a solution for him was, I'm really going to get to know these kids. I'm going to be sort of on the ground with these kids. And then we'll build that rapport and respect for each other. So he did something called the three-column exercise. Um, and if you have a pen and paper with you right now, I challenge you to do this. It's tough. Um, for teachers to do and anyone that's describing people. We usually don't think of choosing a, choosing a student and then describing them in three nouns and three verbs. We're very often quick to um, describe them with adjectives. They're very creative, they're artistic, they're funny, they're overactive, <laughs> um, you know, they're lazy, they're not doing homework, everything that comes out um, on our best days and our worst days. But his first move is to memorize the names of his kids. And he circles the number of students and posts it 
you know, in the upper right hand corner of his paper. And sometimes, you know, he has three or four classes like many middle school teachers do, sometimes five or six. Um, it takes time, but really beginning with the student names was important. Um, and he begins to be very curious about their identity. Um, you know, their ethnic backgrounds. He asks kids to tell them the story of their name. So I'm going to just sit quiet for a second. And if you are with us today and you have a pen and paper in front of you, um, I want you to just think of a student for a second. And it could be anybody or a child that you have in mind from years past or maybe a child right now in your classroom. And I want you to just take a second and start to think of that child in nouns um, and verbs. I remind you again to push you to try and not use adjectives. Something I found, um, my sixth grade team does this often at our um, team meetings. We have a specific time where we, we have kid talk um, during our meetings, every meeting. And um, we found that it's easy to go to the students that you are maybe more familiar with or that are more extroverted. But when it comes down to students that seem to hide or be more introverted, um, we tried this and it was a really tough day for some of us because there was certain kids that we could just do no problem. You know, we have responsive classrooms, we think, and we hope every day. But there are certain kids that just are under the radar and it was really tough for us to come up with nouns and verbs. And those are the kids that Don Graves says, you need to sit down with them, you need to conference with them, you need to talk with them, you need to observe them um, and listen. And so um, this is a challenge that I give to you that we are doing um, currently right now in our school year and we revisit it about um, three times a semester um, personally but then we have kid talk at every meeting as well. So how are middle schoolers described? Um, it ranges from <laughs> the, the funny to the nasty to um, the lovely empathetic ways that you can remember your years as a middle schooler. Um, these guys will tell you when we're looking at middle schoolers that we're going to have some myth busters today. So when people see middle schoolers and I think about middle schoolers and I tell people I teach middle school, they often either apologize or they gasp or they, they're like, oh, how do you do that, you know, or my heart goes out to you or, and then I end up telling them how funny and how great they are, but we're going to handle a little bit of myth busters for me and the kids today. So when you think about middle schoolers, we hear that they're stubborn and judgmental. The kids will tell you their myth buster is that actually middle schoolers have a pretty acute sense of justice for themselves and for others. Middle schoolers, they're narcissistic. We're in the age of selfies now where I constantly see this in the halls um, after school and the kids are very excited to take pictures of themselves, but that doesn't mean they're narcissistic. It's really what they talk about with me is that they're actively working to build their identity and are open to self-reflection and change. Not in their words, but this is something that Smokey and I talk a lot about in our book. This is one of my favorite shots. Um, that's two teachers there in the center. Um, middle schools are always challenging authority. The myth, the, mis the buster there is that they're balancing the desire for independence with also the need for guidance. And that's four of my girls kind of circled around two teachers and they're helping each other get through some technology troubleshooting. I think this one is actually more the kids than the students, but it's a shared guidance. Middle school kids are needy. Not the case, the kids say. They want meaningful relationships with adults. I, I had a conversation with one of my girls just the other day, actually, and she said, oh, it's driving me crazy. My parents are, you know, when I want them to be there, they're not. They're busy, and then when they want to talk to me, they're hovering over me. And so I kind of laughed out loud, and I actually sh showed her 
the Chip Woods book I was talking about. She goes, I know, you talk about that all the time. And I said, I know, but it's in here. This is who you are. This is part of your developmental stage. And she said, well, it's frustrating. And then we had a, we laughed about it in that moment. This is the one we all love. Middle schoolers are uncomfortable with intimacy. We've all had this experience in middle school, or we see it every day. Um, middle schoolers are seeking intimacy but unsure how to act on it. That's Vicente, unsure how to take a picture next to Lucy. Middle schoolers, they're hormone ravaged. Actually, they're going through a pretty predictable, positive, and well understood developmental stage and changes. Um, this is Nick and Kaido, and they are actually reading the Middle School Survival Guide, which I have a group of about four boys that hide this. It, like some of us used to hide under the sheets with a flashlight and read, or we catch our kids doing that um, today. Um, these guys hide this book every day and huddle around it. And sometimes they're snickering, and sometimes they're pointing, and sometimes I'm reading over their shoulder, but um, they love this book, and I'm soon able to talk to them about it. Middle schoolers act childish. Middle schoolers still love to play and imagine. You know, there's, I know in certain middle schools, we used to have recess when I was in middle school. I know that some schools hopefully still do, but really this is a retreat that we went on last year. We went to a few museums. Um, around San Diego and took them to the park and all the kids when they did a survey at the end said this was this was their favorite part. They just had some downtime together to just play and be with each other. Middle schoolers, there's emo they're emotionally volatile. I talk to the kids all the time about their amygdala um, and how fully developed their amygdala is um, and I tell them it's both like a superpower um, that they have and also a little bit of kryptonite. We read a great Superman book called Boys of Steel at the beginning of the year. Um, but you know the, the middle school amygdala is far more developed than the adult amygdala. It's a little brain science for you um, because our frontal cortex is now fully developed. But that amygdala, I tell them, is why they're laughing one minute and they're crying another minute and they're screaming at someone the next minute. Or you know, um, for me, this is my favorite part about them. I tell them is their amygdala because it actually this is where you can grab them and you know, allow them to ask these questions and be these active participants in the world um, because they're so compassionate about what they're reading and engaged in. Middle schoolers are jumpy and squirmy and can't sit still. Now, that is true, and being a middle school teacher, I think some of us are still like that as well. It's not that can't sit still is a bad thing. They're just full of energy. So hopefully when you're looking at your classroom environments for middle schoolers, you're allowing them time to move about the room, to change from um, maybe sitting on the rug with you to collaborative desks or groups. Um, my kids can come in and read. I'll show you some slides of my room environment a little bit later that sort of lends itself to this developmental stage that they are in of needing a lot of um, mental breaks, the kids call them. Sometimes they'll be super focused and then they'll say to me, Miss Ahmed, I need a mental break and that just means they're going to go get a drink. Um, so knowing what we do know about middle schoolers and either our own experience as teachers or as middle schoolers ourselves, we have to start thinking about what they need in terms of classroom climate, of instruction. Um, what do they need from teachers? Um, what do they need from their subject matter topics? What do they want to learn about? And the materials and tools in the classroom, you know, what are the values of the classroom, the norms and attitudes, and, you know, the space. And one of the ways that I do this at the beginning, um, and Brian talked a little bit about how our book um, speaks to the themes of identity, is that um, the very first day of school we read um, Boys of Steel. It was the picture book I was telling you about. I'm sorry, I'm drawing a blank on the author right now. But um, we start to pull out um, themes of identity and what that means. And there's another great story called The Bear That Wasn't as well that I use um, from an organization called Facing History and Ourselves. Um, but we talk about identity and we say, okay, so what makes up a person's identity? What, what do you think about when you're thinking of someone's identity? And we read this book together. Um, and as things start to come out, we start to create this shared chart that we have, an anchor chart that stays up in our room um, all year. 
And so I, I, we talk a lot about, wow, like all of these things are a piece of you. You know, you're not just this one-dimensional thing. You're sort of the sum of your parts. And um, these pieces of your identity form your opinions you're going to make, your choices you're going to make, the type of learner that you are, the athlete that you are, the artist you are, the musician you are. Um, and all of those things come from there. And so we really have to practice this habit of perspective because everyone is coming from a different place, um, from a different part of the world, from a different um, thought, uh, for different family backgrounds, um, ethnicities, religions, traditions, celebrations, all of these great things on this list that we came up with. So the kids start to really turn it into themselves and say, well, who am I, you know, and how do I see myself? And this is a great time in your life to do that because they're constantly questioning who they are each day. And that's rapidly changing as well because they um, are engaged in such self-exploration. So one of the days I do, um, and this is a little bit of a way to introduce myself to you as well, um, is that I take the doc camera and I, right there in front of them, I start to build my own identity web with them. Um, and I start to say, okay, well, I take things from our chart. I'm gonna, I look at our chart. I have it right next to me, and I'm going to say, okay, so these are some of the things about me that I really want to share with you guys, and this is one of my first steps in building this rapport with them. Um, I was often told, you know, in my school of ed classrooms and from professionals throughout in my early years of teaching, you know, you're not their friend. Try not to be their friend. You know, dress professionally the first few weeks of school and um, always dress professionally but you know extreme professionalism in your dress the first few weeks of school and you know don't smile and Smokey always jokes that people would say don't smile till Christmas um, and this is this is the window for them and the door that opens between us that I can say you know this is who I am as a human being um, and middle schoolers want to see you that way and all kids want to see you that way you know we're not sleeping under the desk at school and they won't freak out when you see them in public but um, one of the pieces that I share that's really important with them um, and that I begin to build a homeschool connection with is um, some of the words that you see or hear on the screen um, from my background. You know, I am American, but my parents are born um, in India, and they came over in the 70s as immigrants, and that's a big piece of my identity as I get older. Um, but what's also important to me is that I'm from Chicago, I was born and raised, um, and, you know, that my parents are religious, and I grew up that way, and I'm also a huge sports fan, and I, I coach. That's why I coach here with you guys at Bishops. And um, I start to share these pieces, and what happens as I'm sharing is the kids have it open in their notebooks as well. Um, and I say, okay, now draw that circle with your name in the middle and start to really think about yourself. And can you guys start connecting to me? And I would do this with you if we were interacting in a group as well today. But um, I would say, what things can you start connecting with me? And what questions do you have for me? And I say, there's nothing off limits. You can go ahead and ask me a question about anything that you see up here. And I usually have a lot of kids yelling out about how they love the Bulls too, or, oh, I've been to Chicago, or um, I play soccer too. Who's your favorite team? And that's a great way to start, again, our relationship. So I do have them try their own in their notebooks. Um, and do a little bit of independent practice and for you now today as well um, at home if you want to give this a shot um, I'll give you about 30 seconds to try but even just getting maybe some of the the pieces of identity down um, on the list but this is really something important it's something that I did at the very beginning of my um, teaching career with again the organization facing history in ourselves and it really caused me to look in word a lot more than I have and it wasn't an easy exercise to do and once you start to unpack a piece of who you are um, as a human being you really start to understand yourself as a learner and so the kids come up with some pretty great webs and they get to share them around the room um, and find connections between each other I really get them to celebrate their ethnicities uh, their backgrounds from where their families came from you know stories of immigration um, for them to start being comfortable with who they are and it starts to break down some of the walls and the stereotypes that can come up and it really just opens a safe space for kids to start asking questions and being okay with asking questions and this is the beginning of our inquiry journey together. So again when we're looking at what do we what do middle schoolers need in terms of climate and instruction, teachers, getting to know them as one. And we really just need to ask them. They're the experts on it. So Key here can tell you a little bit about this. And what I do is I hand out a reflection um, at the beginning of the year. I call it a voice my needs survey. 
and I asked them just to sort of describe the perfect space for you. Not what would the space look like, and what what do you need as a learner? Um, and some of the kids will put things like you see here, you know, guidance from a teacher, a quiet environment. <laughs> um, some of the kids need music because you know they can do four or five things at once now. Um, something important to me to read though is when I say teachers should, you know, in middle schoolers they they they're honest. They say try and understand student problems. You know, they should we should laugh and smile a lot. I absolutely agree. Um, they should make everyday class activities fun and memorable. And you know, I, I, some of the kids are used to hearing lectures, and they don't they don't want to do that. They want to be they want to be asking the questions themselves. And so this final one is, you know, what do you need as a learner? I need a teacher who encourages me and helps me in an environment that is comfortable where I don't feel shy or scared. That to me um, speaks volumes about what middle schoolers need. And that's why my two goals always at the beginning of the year and really emphasizing things that I focus on are the kids and the environment. Um, so this is my classroom, two classrooms, two different classrooms. One um, in the bottom right hand corner is from Burley School in Chicago. Um, and the other one is from my current room at Bishops. And this is what it looks like um, at the beginning of the year when it's nice and clean before the kids get there. And this in the upper right hand corner is as we start to make anchor charts, um, you know, we keep them up for the time period that we need and the kids go back to them, but they're shared space for us, um, a shared guidance for them. Um, they go to them and we create rubrics. Um, from these anchor charts that we build together. And then you can see some picture frames sort of in the background because the kids really do need to be part of the room and part of the design process. Um, and this is what it looks like with them <laughs> in it. It's full and it's messy, but I'm getting over that now. Um, this is their reading space in the upper left-hand corner there. We start in the mornings and then every passing period we start with something I call a soft start which is really just a time for them to come in and independently read from anywhere in the library, the nonfiction section, the magazines that I have, the novels that I have, the picture books. Um, and it's a time for a very busy and rushed day um, and a bell schedule where they can come in and just relax and be themselves. And you do see them without shoes on in that photograph but that they decided that it's comfortable for them. They love it. And parents tell me that's a hot topic at dinner. Um, this is just a group mini lesson in the upper right hand corner and down at the right bottom corner is Mila and if you're wondering why her foot is up there it's because she was having a hard time balancing the desk while she was trying to draw her mammoth in her cave. Um, and that's Maddie. She built this fort this summer because she needed a place and if you were to look in this, zoom into the sign right here it says no boys allowed. She needed a space to be able to read because the boys were being loud readers as she said. So. Um, once you're set on really focusing on practicing the the art of getting to know your kids and listening to the words of Don Graves and being there with them and setting up an environment that makes them feel safe and able to take risks and ask questions, you can start to work on some really great inquiry work with them. And one of the ways I pulled them in at the beginning of the year and of the unit of our unit that we're currently doing right now, which is a civil rights unit, is um, reading an image. And reading an image, I tell them, is a lot like the strategies that we use. Um, Steph Harvey and Anne Goodbase talk about this in Toolkit. Um, David Pearson talks about it. There's so many, so many authors and mentors of mine that um, use these reading strategies. But I tell the kids the same reading strategies that we're using or reading our texts and our nonfiction um, can be used when you're reading an image. So you're still activating your background knowledge as soon as you see the photo and you're questioning maybe the photographer or the image themselves and you're starting to draw inferences by things that you piece together and you're determining what the not the author but the author of the photograph being the photographer really wants you to think is important. Um, and then you're monitoring your comprehension as you go because the kids will start to realize and you'll see in just a second of where misconceptions can come up the same way they do when we have meaning breakdown in reading. Um, and finally you're summarizing and synthesizing what you see. So together again um, if you have a paper in front of you and you can divide it into four squares just quickly while you're taking notes or you can just be a visual learner today um, and have you divide your paper into four squares. And what I'm going to show you in just a second is an image that's actually broken up into quadrants. And I want you to think about each quadrant as you see it as zoomed in. And I want you to think about what you see, what you think, and wonder. Um, this is something that comes from Harvard Project Zero that we use in class and it's another way to 
allow kids to show their thinking about what they really see in the photograph and then use that evidence, the literal evidence about what you see. So if it's a tree, if it's a color, whatever it is that's literal, tell me what you see. And then use that evidence to build some inferential thinking. What, what are you thinking now? What inferences are you making? And then start to show me your thinking and questions. So here's the first quadrant. I want you just to think about, and this is how I talk through the kids with it as well, you know, what do you see in this photograph? We talk a lot about how to view an image, so looking at the lighting, looking at the foreground of the picture and of the background, looking around the photo, looking for things that are familiar to you or unfamiliar to you. More often straining our eyes to get in as close as we can with these images, and with the historical images it's a little bit harder because of the resolution. But start to the kids will start to fill out their squares in this see, think, wonder format. So they'll say, show me what, you're, what you see. And then show me on your paper with using your inner voice. We talk a lot about their inner voice. What are you What are you thinking right now? And then what are you wondering? And I give them about a minute or two to do this. And then a great way to collaborate on this, where everyone is involved, is that they get to use their inner voice first and slow down their thinking a little bit. And then they turn and talk with a buddy, um, and they share and steal and celebrate good ideas with each other. Here's quadrant two. I know I'm moving quickly. I usually don't move this fast in class. Again, in quadrant two, start to think about what you see. And then show me your thinking using that evidence of, to form inferences, connections. You begin to synthesize your learning a little bit, maybe from the first quadrant and the second quadrant. And show some questions. Show me your thinking and questions. When we talk to kids about showing us our, their thinking and questions, it really relieves them from the stress of being right or wrong. Um, I found that recently, that kids are really concerned with saying the wrong thing or they're feeling fearful that they might be wrong in front of their peers. But if you start to use that language, show me your thinking through a question. Um, you can build that safety and also the, the deeper knowledge and active, active reading that they can do. So here's quadrant three. This is when I hear some audible gasps or kids start to get really excited. Oh, like, you know, the, the image really dramatically changes here for them. There's new things. I start to say, look around the photo. What do you notice um, in the corners? What is the photographer asking you to look at in this very speci specific piece of this image? And you should start to be developing some pretty good questions by now. And then again, they'll turn and talk, and I'll ask them to share. I'll say, can someone share a partner's see or a partner's wonder or a partner's think? And I do that because kids are so often excited to raise their hand and say, well, I saw, I saw, I saw. And um, we're trying to move from that to saying, okay, well, I was being a really active listener with my buddy, and here's what they said, and here's what I can celebrate. And we really talk about like using collaborative language when they're sharing out loud with the whole group. You know, something that we noticed, or something that my partner noticed, or something I didn't see before that so and so pointed out to me is a great way to pull kids in together and celebrate each other. And here's the last one. Continue on that same train of thought. There's new pieces to this this part of the photograph as well. What do you see and what do you think? What do you wonder what are you wondering now after seeing all four quadrants?
some of you are hanging out with a buddy right now and your PJ is watching, then this would be a fun activity to turn and talk with right now. But a lot of the kids, when they're sharing out, will talk about um, the color of the photograph. You know, I see that it's black and white. I see people. I see a star. I see um, a tank, you know, the military. And if they start to infer in their Cs, I'll say, well, what do you specifically see? Um, and pull their th slow down their thinking just a little bit. And or if they say something like, you know, I see that people are at war, then you can start to ask them questions rather than just saying, oh, great, you know, they're at war, you're right. You can say, well, what makes you think they're at war? Show me the evidence in this. And it starts to build those evidence-based arguments, those evidence-based um, responses that, you know, all types of standards and teachers around the country are looking for right now. So I'm going to open up the photograph for you. And this is a great moment because this you, image always pops up off the screen for the kids. Um, and they get so excited. And I said, and right away, I usually say I, they want to talk right away. So I'll say, quick, turn and talk to your buddy that you've been talking about this to the whole time. And it's not about being right or wrong now, but what are you guys really seeing? And now piece all of those, you know, little tokens of evidence together and start to really talk about this photograph. And so I let them talk. Um, they add to their see, think, wonders in all four quadrants now. This is a great piece where, again, when you talk about meaning breakdown and literacy, um, kids' misconceptions come out about reading these photographs. Um, you know, from based from quadrant one that may have thought something completely different seeing that Volkswagen van to um, seeing now quadrant four and now seeing the whole picture together and you know what is that Volkswagen bus doing there and they're looking for the writing on the sign um, and then what I do is I give them just a tiny piece of background knowledge um, and I tell them that this is something called Checkpoint Charlie those of you that are at home that are thinking oh yes I knew that or oh my gosh I'm way off um, this, is, this is a great moment so this is Checkpoint Charlie in West Berlin in 1961 and so that opens up you know so many questions what's Checkpoint Charlie oh I've heard of that before is that World War II what era you know what era is that Miss Ahmed and so we just give them a ton of space to write down all those questions, and I say, get it down on paper quick before you, you know, before you forget it. Um, and we talk a little bit about this. So, what are you wondering now? And we build a huge list together as a class. You know, what questions might you have for the photographer of this photo, for the people in the photograph, um, for the time period and the setting of this photograph? And we just build a huge list together after they've done their turn and talk. And I showed show it to them on the screen and just celebrate how excited I am about their curiosity. So one of the things I was um, hoping, and I'm pulling this out from what a kid asked, and maybe you guys had the same question today, was from box two in quadrant two, um, what does the sign say? And this is always something fun to zoom into. Um, but there it is in German, and I will slaughter it, so I won't even give it a shot. But um, what it does say is nobody has any intention of building a wall. And this was said by the General Secretary of the Socialist, Socialist Union, Unity Party of Germany on June 15th, 1961. No intention of building the wall. Well, when we talk about this with the kids, and I say, okay, so this is what that sign actually says, and they said, well, yeah, there's no wall there. And I said, okay, well, and then this is what happens two months later. And I have multiple images um, that I show them with this. So then, you know, again, questions. Why are they building the wall? How, you know, I thought they said they weren't going to build the wall. Who is building the wall? Um, and you get to start, it just opens up a world of inquiry um, about that era. So when we're looking at images in art, I use this to draw them in because, number one, like I said, it does draw them in, but it also grows this amazing center for collaboration in your room. You know, everyone is included. Um, there's an accountable talk. You'll see it. Um, in some of Smokey's videos and Steve Zellman's videos and best practice, um, you can see the kids going through this, but they are pointing at the screen. Some of them are getting up and moving to the screen. You know, they're asking, like, Miss Ahmed, can I go up there and just point out something? Absolutely. Um, everyone's engaged. Um, it gives kids thinking time as well. 
um, for kids that need to just slow down and get their thinking out so no one's shouting out anything. If you do it in those layers where they use their inner voice first and then they turn and talk and then we share out with the whole group. I mean, it builds the strategies of cl critical literacy. And then what it does for me also is that it builds momentum for inquiry. And so this is something that um, we just started in this last two weeks about Little Rock. Um, and we're starting um, a whole literature circle inquiry around Little Rock and the integration of Central High. And so this is another photo that you can cut if, you, if you're if you looking at this photo now in quadrants because that's how your brain is thinking right now. This is another great one to use. Um, in the upper right-hand corner, you see just the American flag. Um, you know, in the bottom right-hand corner, you see pieces of the flag and a woman that's well-dressed. And then you start to get into the signs. It's a fantastic image to use, um, among many others, with the Little Rock Nine integrating Central High. And this is not from this photograph. It's from another one um, that I use with the Little Rock Nine being escorted, but I split this photograph into three sections, not quadrants, and you can see the division between the lines of the sea thinks and wonders that the kids are sharing, and it shows their inner voice as they're thinking. We really push the I see, I think, and wonder language. Um, some background knowledge I built after I showed them a photograph was that I said, okay, now we're going to read a poem together, um, and this poem is going to really bring this image alive for you guys. Um, and so we read it together on the doc camera just as a shared reading, and I model my thinking and my leaving tracks of my thinking as I go, and the kids are writing down new information as they go and questions they continue to have, so now we're building just this huge, huge resource of questions that we all have. Um, and then I send them to Edmodo where I keep a lot of my resources for them and where we can have an online collaborative discussion. Um, this works in a computer lab, on iPads, at home, everywhere that um, kids can have access to the internet. Um, and it builds, I have a small community for each class. And so here before I start teaching them how to do safe searching on the internet and just the beginning stages of building research skills, um, I provide some research links for them in a folder and it's called their backpack on Edmodo. They can go straight to their backpack and I have some audio links, I have some PBS links, some photos here. And this is where the kids, I say, okay, now you get to go home tonight for homework and whatever questions you have in our mini inquiry today, you're just going to you're going to ask whatever questions you'd like and find out stuff and then come back and share it with us online as a discussion. And so this is, again, sorry, this is a great way for the kids to collaborate online at home and in their own time when they need to. And they'll check back in in the morning and they'll check in at night and um, these are what some of the kids shared. And then we talk about using the at Gabriel, you know, the at symbol, at Jacqueline, if you're really going to speak to someone specifically and to push their thinking. Um, but you can see the kids are starting to build a great community. They don't know each other coming into sixth grade, and so um, this is a great way to start that, and they love it because it starts to look like Facebook um, and online social networks for kids. So here's my question I posed them, and you can see right in the middle of the screen there that I have 85 replies from one class of um, 20. From those questions, we move on um, into me book talking. Um, I got a couple of great recommendations from my colleague Ben Kovacs back in Chicago at Burley School um, for a lit circle inquiry. He does a phenomenal job of this inquiry in his classroom in sixth grade, and so we're starting um, to collaborate a little bit more online and through Twitter with our kiddos. Um, but these are some of the books that they're going to be reading. I just book talked these the other day, and in mini lessons for lit circles and a few other. Um, books, text, professional texts that I use, um, we start to build book ballots and the kids just recently voted and they'll find out what their books they got on Monday and Tuesday. And so this is them kind of perusing through the books, spending some time with the books while they're filling out their book ballots. They're really excited. So I'm just going to go ahead and wrap up. I know I'm running out of time, but um, this is a great text that Smokey introduced to me um, from Dave Brown and Trudy Knowles. Um, what every middle school teacher should know, along with many others. I know Nancy Atwell just came back out with her third edition of In the Middle. Um, there's so many books for middle school teachers to dig into these days, and I'm really loving that sort of resurgence for the middle school. Um, but this is a great quote from them. If you see what young adolescents bring to your classroom as a promise rather than a problem, middle school teaching can be one of the most exciting and satisfying things you'll ever do. 
I couldn't agree more. Um, the fact is that young adolescents have tons of questions and concerns about themselves and their world and their imagination and curiosity work around the clock. So they love ideas of those if those ideas shed light on the topics they are personally and socially significant to them. You know, they told me that in their survey that I gave them earlier. So they love to explore and debate issues of fairness and justice. Absolutely. You know, if you see young adolescents this way and learn how to teach like that, along the way they will learn more and more and learn better if you see who they are as a problem and what you have to solve. So again, um, I want to thank you guys for being here today with us. Um, our book, here's another great selfish plug for us, um, is coming out in November. And everything that you saw today, pieces of it are in there. Um, and mostly, hopefully, what you can get for more than anything from our book is that we love middle school kids and we hope that you can engage with their hearts and their minds and you know push them to be the, the global citizens of the world that we know they are because they're compassionate, they're curious, and they are pretty hilarious. So um, Brian, I want to thank you for having me today. I can't see where I am on the screen, but I know I'm there. No problem. I'll, I'll just okay. put our, our logo up there. So. They're great. There are tons of tweets, but but uh, they're all just enthusiastic and and uh, interested in what you've been doing. We didn't really get any questions, but um, people really seem to like it, and I think we're good. Do you have anything else to say? No, I just want to thank everybody for being here today. I'm excited to go watch the archives of everyone else. Great. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye.